Welcome to Timelines, episode 149. Today in Timelines, we have Heather Havenwood from Austin, Texas. She's a thought leader, entrepreneur, fitness freak, and chief sexy boss. Whoa. <laughs> Welcome, Heather, to Timelines. About who you are, how you got to where you are today. That's what we normally ask when we start. But I'm going to ask you one more question. What's your normal routine like? How do you start your day? And then we'll find out who you are. Sure. So you're live in, in Austin, Texas, in my office. Um, and let's see. Well, I, I'm in Austin, Texas. Like I said, my name is Heather Havenwood. You can find me at heatherhavenwood.com. My daily routine is I wake up and I live in the middle of downtown Austin, um, right near the Barton Springs. If you're familiar with Austin, there's this beautiful Barton Springs. And so every morning I wake up and I go walk my dog down the Barton Springs. I kind of get out away from any kind of computers. I and mean, I do take my cell phone with me. I do because just because something happens, but I don't get on the phone. I try to be with nature as much as I possibly can. And then I come, come back. I do coffee. I do some breathing exercises actually. Um, and the, actually I've always mentioned this. The first thing I do first, 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 before I even walk my dog is I have two glasses of unfiltered water, uh, alkaline water. Now here's why is because someone told me this, who's a, what I call a, a, a life hack. He's kind of a brainy hack. That's what he calls himself. And when you're sleeping all day, all night, right? Eight hours, four hours, whatever it is, six hours, your brain's getting dehydrated. So when you first wake up drinking at least 16 ounces of water, wakes your brain up. And then I go walking out in the open air and then I drink coffee. Then after all that and doing this breathing exercise, then I come up here to this lovely, awesome computer that I have. And I look outside um, to my beautiful trees because I'm on like a third level on the condo and the condo looks up into the trees. I'm actually right. You know, you right funny now. you mentioned your computer. So I used to that's ask my uh, daily PC? routine. Oh, good, good, good. It's so much easier with Mac. Oh, Macker. Mac Especially is, in this uh, business, you know, um, yeah, and we're sort of in similar businesses, but different point. ways you're, you've uh, evolved. Yeah. So tell us about what you're doing today and how you got there. So I have a company, Pure Woman, actually, and then I have my T-shirt, Being the Boss is Sexy. Um, I have a book called Sexy Boss, and the intention of that book came out about – three years, two, three years ago. Can't remember the date now. And it came out because I want to share my story about kind of my journey of entrepreneurship. At that point, I hadn't really told my story. I was always a person behind the scenes, behind the curtain. I built another business, but in the dating niche. And um, I really wanted to share my story with the world. And a friend of mine, Joe Sugarman said to me one day, you're kind of like a, you're like a sexy boss. He just said it. We're at in Vegas having lunch and he just said it. And I went, that's hot. And I looked online, you know, who owns it and then trademarked it and type of stuff like that. And then we kind of went down this road. Um, but honestly, what I do every day online is I do a ton of email marketing. I do lead generation, affiliate marketing, JV brokering, a lot of things like that in the world. And then on top of that, I have um, 10 clients. I only take on 10 clients at a time for coaching. And I usually have clients that already have some kind of big business, like they're successful in their own right. And they're looking to me to help them like what I call create another business inside their business, usually in the information marketing industry, because that's what I've been dealing with for 15 years is really information marketing. And information marketing first started what I call offline, and now it's online. I'll agree with you. But I'm there, really um, an information because we've had been in the real estate business for 25 years in d two different states. And it used to be definitely offline because it's all about information, moving stuff around, relationships. And I'll tell you what, in our industry, um, yeah. the getting along with people is so critical. And it sounds like that's what you work on is teaching people how to get along, how to enhance their sales, things of that nature. So how do you do that? How do you how do you work with people one on one? What's your yeah. coaching like? My coaching really is it's funny because uh, when I first start working with people, I feel like the first thing I'm working with them on is telling them to stop doing everything. Yeah. They're not allowed to buy anything for like 60 days. <laughs> um don't buy any courses. Don't buy this. Don't buy. The reason I say that is because you want to have a clean slate. What happens is we're getting bombarded, bombarded, bombarded with so many courses and things. And da, 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 is that you need to like 
get clarity and quiet. And so when I work with them one on one, we want to first get really clear on what the heck they're going to do and what's the message to market. And sometimes that 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 takes 60 days, 30 days it depends on the person, depends where they come from, depends on what their background is. So getting really, really clear in the communication, just like in real estate. I mean, you can focus on big homes, small homes. You can focus on flipping. You can focus on lease options. I mean, there's the gamut. You got to pick one to start. And then you can kind of grow and expand your product line, aka your services over time. Same thing with information marketing. You got to pick one. You got to pick a niche. You got to pick an avatar. Once that kind of so grows, somebody starting. Start so, what's your um, typical client? What's the profile of That's your hard. avatar? Thank you for asking that. My typical, so my client base, um, I call him Bob. Um, Bob is the age range. Really, it's it's forty to fifty five. That's been the market. Um, it's male and female. Most of my clients, eighty percent of my clients, are males, and they're looking to how can I get more clients, ex expand my sales. Um, and become more of a leader and uh, more of a face of their business. And then how can I take my knowledge and somehow monetize it? You know, a real estate it? agent, so what you I'm just described is what a real estate on. agent needs to do. And in the industry, in the housing industry, I'd say it's about a 70, 30 mix yeah. with women to men. I'm not sure why that mix is exactly, but. And real estate investors is opposite. You know, because I, I worked in the real estate investment industry since 2001. That's kind of where I got my you know, teeth, you know, what I call teeth bitten off. Right. So I, I learned in that industry, which is, oh, God, 80 percent male, I would say almost 90 percent male as investors, people who are flipping houses, buying and selling, rehabbing. Like That's an investor. Right. And then you have the sales of real estate agents. And for some reason, that's more female. Um, but yeah, that is a different kind of different aspect. And then the industry of real estate investing, this is kind of an interesting, um, this is just interesting. I don't know if you might find it interesting or not, but the average real estate investor spends between 10 to $40,000 in information marketing much? products before wow. they make their first deal. Uh huh. Yeah. And, um, it's an interesting statistic. And the reason why it's so interesting is that basically if they did that statistic for in information marketing or internet marketing, how much money people spend on internet marketing courses before they actually make their first dollar. Wow. I bet it's about the same. I, I would be, wouldn't be surprised because it takes for some reason in, in most people's brains, it takes all that information, mm -hmm. not about the information, but to get the confidence to get the confidence to make the shift. And then once they make the shift, then it's like a, over and over and over and over and over again, right? But it's that kind of that shift to the confidence to make their first deal. And with internet marketing, it's making their first dollar. When you get your first dollar from an information marketing product, there's something that your brain goes. I, I believe you. Oh I make God, money works. helping you know, out with websites, and I think doing it's the same certain thing. things. But, believe, yeah. but information marketing does take some time. It, um, that, you know what? I, you have an open invitation, like we talked about, to come back on our Friday show where you go more into detail about some of those techniques that you've used to build your business, which we'd really like to find more about, but uh, that's really good. So um, going on, um, I have an Thank example, you. for example, watching women in our offices, we have an office in California uh, of all different ages. It's really interesting to see the combinations, but teams seem to do well, yeah, a, a couple together, but um, you know, just, just getting mm -hmm. along with people seems to be the most important element in, in that business. Connecting, yeah. So how, go ahead. Connecting. I think that's why information marketers do so well is uh, the ones that are willing to put their name and face out there is because people right. people do business about, with people. What's the people online do ratio to the uh, actually seeing people talking to people? I mean, the one thing about this business, what I found so is question, I was yeah, in a business so you're design, build, construction for many years as long as a reservist. Half my time is in the field. And then half my time is engineering behind the scenes and, and meeting and, and networking with people. Like I was vice mayor of the Building Industry Association. By the way, one last thing. My number one general contractor I worked with, designed a lot of her houses, was a wonderful female in great shape, looked a lot like you. And she was the best general we ever had. Great, made amazing custom houses. She just knew how to make things work. Mm. Mm, thanks for that. I, My I wife misses want, it very, very much. We don't build builder. anymore. I think she, that'd be good, <laughs> actually. That's, 
Yeah, I think it's what women are naturally to do. Like they manage. Women manage. We manage household. We manage our men. You know, we manage our kids. We man we manage. We're really good yeah. at managing things and multiple things and multitasking. So I think I'd be good to answer your question though. I think for the I've been in this industry since two thousand one, and I would say where I'm at now, I do less mm -hmm. networking. I'm I'm what I call a picky networker. Very picky. I will connect online. I will reach out. But as far as like full networking where I'm like traveling somewhere, I have an internet marketing party here in Austin. I've been going to um, once a month for seven years. Um, and then I'm going to some other events this year, but I'm picky and I'm masterminds mainly because I've been around the industry so long. I really just want to surround myself with, uh, with people that I want to make sure that they can lift me up and I can lift them up. And based on one of the success principles where I talked about is never keep anyone in my life that's not part of my fan club. And I want to be part of their fan club. And so it's a vice versa. So I want to be able to be part of their fan club and I want people to be part of my fan club. So I'm what I call a picky networker now. But at, there, that, at one point, God, I built, my per, me personally, I built and created and produced between 350 to 450 seminars over a period of time. And then on top of that, I went to seminars. So there was a particular point in my life that I would call, I was a seminar slut, I guess, because I was constantly going and I was learning, 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 learning. Um, I've obviously scaled that down at this point in my life. I may go to one or two a year at this point, but there was definitely a point where I was on that learning curve. And when you first start, I think you have to dive in and go to everything. So you can, with you that, can, we're going to go to you a can break. absorb all the different viewpoints. With that, we're going to go to a break. No problem. Well, that means it's commercial time, and we always want to thank Share the Oils, Share the Oils of Northern Nevada. We appreciate everything you do for this program, your technology, your background, and your products. And a commercial for netcasting101.com. That's mine. And that's the digital product that you were just talking about needs to get up. And it will be up. It was supposed to be up by Christmas um, of this year. And it is uh, you're, it's so true. Getting that first digital product is tough. I'm, I'm around all these brilliant WordPress people and even instructors and teachers in the WordPress community, uh, helping them produce podcasts. And it's tough. I've got to get that first product up. So I thank you, Heather, for that uh, sort of hitting me right there without even realizing it. Yeah, well, I apologize for hitting you, but get it up. Make well, your first you. dollar. <laughs> join your community here. The yeah. other thing, too, is I want to go back. You talked about uh, seminars, and I used to go to a lot in the building industry as I evolved, and I enjoyed those. We'd make those you know, paid vacations to some really nice places with my wife and I, and I do miss going to the seminars. And I'll probably start going again, but what I found in this business, you got to be behind the computer. you got to be working, and if you're out at a seminar, you're not doing your job because it's, it's – yeah, there's some truth to that. I um I think also getting away from the computer in this in this job is important too. Um I like I said I go to a few masterminds a year and I go to right now two events a year currently. And then that's it, you know, but when I'm there, I'm there. I'm fully present. I'm not up in my room doing email marketing or anything like that. I mean, I really am focused on being present and connecting with as many people as possible, old, new, and hopefully creating new friends. So what events do you go to? Yeah. So currently in 2015, the two I go to that are what I call public events. There's affiliate summit. Um, there's also what I call a side event that happens with that one. And the, a traffic and conversion summit in San Diego with Ryan Dice and Perry Belcher. So uh, Ryan Dice and Perry Belcher actually, when I first got started in the dating niche, they actually published me back in like 2010, I mean 2009. And they're actually down the street from me. Their offices are literally a mile and a half from my office. So I've known those guys for years. That event really has become, I think the, the event that you go to, to, to like, make sure you're on the track, you know, like, Hey, am I doing everything that I need to do? Um, cause they do a great job of bringing really the best experts of, of the digital marketing space. I think it's great. They, they do a good job. Very good. So that's, that's wild. So those two you go to, I got a question to follow up. Why is San Diego have so many podcasters and so many, uh, bloggers? I mean, it's like, seems like the capital of the world. I disagree country. with that. I think it's all Austin. Oh, Austin. Yeah, Austin. Well, early on in Austin, you always heard about Austin technology. 
Yeah, well, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think we, we we here in Austin, being from the Internet Marketing Party, we started that in like 2007, David Gonzalez. And uh -huh. I, I went to the very, very first Internet Marketing Party. And I laugh at it now because it was me and like 10 people. And we stand in like a, a circle and we kind of pass the mic like, hi, I'm Heather. I make money online. And then we pass the mic. Right. And I just went to our uh, what our one from the, for the year end, you know, for December. And there was, oh, my God, I don't even know how many people were there. I would say 200. It was crazy. And you just, it's like this big party. You get to hang out with the great friends. You get to meet new people. You never know who you're going to meet. People fly in. I knew a person that drove in from Houston, flew in from North Carolina. I've known people that have flown in from Australia just to come to this event. And it's at 730 at night. So San Diego and Austin have always had this kind of little battle going on of like, no, right. we have more internet markers. No, we do. Um, I just think honestly that both places have what I call a creative spirit. And I'm, you know, California in general does obviously Silicon Valley. Um, Austin's becoming a mini Silicon Valley. But honestly, I think entrepreneurship just love having a creative energy. And I think that's why they're attracted to both spots. You know, Reno is interesting. Uh, people like to get outside and they retire here. And a lot of folks from Silicon Valley, but they're like living 10 years in the past in technology. So we, it's a little different here. We don't have that interconnectivity, but we do have a lot of events that occur here like Las Vegas. And I really yeah. should take more advantage of those events and go down to those conferences. Hey, one last question. This is a little bit of advice for me. I think I'd like to create um, podcasters movements done really well in Houston. It's Houston, right? Uh, I live in Austin, but Houston. Knew, but Houston's Dallas. where podcasters movement is. Oh, they were in Dallas. Excuse me, Dallas, Dallas. And they're going to be up in Chicago. They're going to be up in Chicago. Down in Dallas. The podcaster <laughs> movers was in Dallas. The last one I saw was in Dallas. That's right. It was Dallas. And they're going to yeah. be up in Chicago in next year, I think. Yeah. They're moving That's up there. But, Dallas is about four hours away. But I'd like to put something. Now, I think we're not going to have a um, uh, new media exposition. It's not going to happen this year. Last year, it happened with national broadcasters, which I loved. I went to that one, really enjoyed it. But I'm thinking about trying to create something out west, but I don't want to put it together myself. I need to go to somebody like you or somebody that used to be like you around here that puts seminars together. Yeah. It's, you know, seminar industry is interesting because you can do it really wrong, really fast and lose a lot of money. You know? right, I can see and that. I'm just being honest. It's not, I'm not trying to deter you. I'm saying when you do it, you do it right. And um, even digital marker, they I've seen them grow and grow and grow. And when they first started, it was actually the Hyatt, which was literally one mile from my house on the same street that I live in actually. And it was, God, the first one was like Ryan and Perry on stage, no vendors out front, maybe one, maybe um, Heather sites. And then I don't know if you were in the room, maybe a hundred. I don't know. A lot of them were local. We're all like, you know, right. and then now where it's at, I mean, it's ridiculously large, but you have to start with the, with kind of the end in mind and be able to allow a seminar to grow and grow and grow. I think people think, Oh, I, it's how easy is this to put a bunch of people butts in seats and then make a thousands of dollars. That's easy. No, it's not. It's not. I mean, Tony, Tony Robbins has done a great job and it's an ongoing machine. It's not something you right. can turn on and then stop. It has to be like this ongoing machine. And that's kind of where, I started in the business. And you can't do it all yourself. No. No. Hey, with that, let's get on to your success principles. Sure. I'm going to read them first. I'm going to read one at a time. Number one, you have three here. Never keep anyone in life that is part. Of, never keep anyone in, in my life that is part of my fan club. I, I think I wrote that down wrong. Yeah. Uh, never keep anyone in my life that's not part of my fan club. Yeah. Okay. You said it better than me. I should have you read these. So explain, explain what that means. Yeah. So that was, a, you know, after my bankruptcy, I was definitely going through some hard times and I had a lot of coaches and mentors along the way. And, and Richard Flint was the one who gave what I call gave that gift to me on that one. And he, uh, when he explained it to me, he said, you know, imagine yourself walking down the street of New Orleans and, uh, you know, New Orleans, right. You have the balconies, people cheering, and then down, uh, you have what I call the dirty gutters. New Orleans is kind of dirty. So you're walking down the street of New Orleans and everyone in your life is there, except that you can only place them in one or two places. They're either in the gutters where they're grabbing on your heels or they're in the balconies and they're cheering you on. Throwing you beat. And so, yeah. And they're throwing beads and they're saying, yeah, go for it, go for it, go for your dreams. And, you know, when you visualize that, the people in your life, no matter if you want to put them in the balcony, you know, they're, they're not, they're, they're grabbing your heels. They're trying to pull you down and that might hurt your emotional feelings. But honestly, you start to see who really is the person, the people that are in the balcony cheering you on. And so I think in my life, I have people, you know, quote unquote, in my life that I would say are at, at 
grabbing at my feet, but I don't share with them as much. You know, I don't really share a lot of my dreams and passions as, as far as uh, what I want to do in my life. I just, you know, spend time with them, but I'm kind of a little more guarded. And then the people that I know in my life that um, are cheering me on, then I, I share because I know that they're a, a person of prosperity and they want it. They want me to succeed because I want them to succeed. So I think that's a, that's the life lesson. Very good. I can relate to New Orleans. I spent a bit of time there. My son lives in the Garden District. He's a Coast Guard oh. pilot there. Yeah. Oh, it's a beautiful city. It is a fun city. It's a fun city, beautiful. especially when you have a place to stay in the market in the Garden District. Yes. So the hotels. It's nice. Okay. Number two. Yeah. Does this feel? Does this feed my conclusions or strengthen my clarity? Does this feed my confusion or strengthen my clarity? Oh, confusion. Okay. Conclusion. Yeah. Confusion. I'm, so, I'm, I'm confused right now. I'm kind of rushing. I was. That's okay. Don't worry about it. I'll, the front I'll, of this. I'll correct you. It's no big deal because I, this is an important one. And I uh, recently just put a post on, on my Facebook and LinkedIn for it, mainly because this one was the one that got me out of my swirl after my bankruptcy. I was really swirling and didn't know what to do. I was really confused, what, you know, feeling a lot of self-doubt and I didn't know what path to take. Where do I go now? Where I thought this was the way to go. I didn't know what to do. How do I? Um, and so when you come out of a fog like that or a, a disbelief on oneself, when you put that question before you do something, even in slow or big choices, it begins to give you clarity, groundedness, and a place to kind of stand from. And I really think that's a principle of leadership and success. You know, you talked about your bankruptcy twice. I know you're around the building industry, um, flipping industry, things of that nature. And we went through some really tough, tough times in that industry. Yeah. I mean, Reno, um, I was in Orlando, Florida. Right. And so, I mean, if you're in Nevada or if you were in Florida, you felt it. Yeah, no matter what part of Florida, what part of um, ne uh, Nevada you were in. Um, so yeah, I was in that industry during that time. And that was what I call my first wave of, of learning the economic wave. You know, my dad went through it in the 80s in the oil business. But I think when I heard him tell the stories, it was like, Psh, that won't happen to me. You know, I was kind of a whippersnapper, right. younger, like, Psh, that was the old timers now. Nah. Now it's this dad. And now I'm like, okay, I, I get it. You know, it goes like this. <laughs> um, I just didn't really think it would happen. Um, but now I understand I'm way more aware of the markets and things like that. Now the economics and watching that the feds just wrote, rose interest rates. I'm Four, watching that yesterday. Yeah. And the oil, oil's down. I'm watching that. I know. Yeah. I've invested in both, both those. those. I, uh, oh, yeah. I got lucky, I got lucky. in, in, So being lucky after, uh, in, in 2007 and eight, I don't know if this is lucky or not, but I was in Afghanistan. So I missed the uh, crash, but I watched the crash from a distance and we'd consolidated quite a bit because of 9-11, I'd really slowed down the construction design build company and really focused on my wife's real estate company. And we did pretty well and we didn't have a lot of exposure. That said, we were still hurt a bit from our own house and, and sales and transaction and everything slowed down, but I was overseas on the war zone. So I missed that. So I think luck and anybody I've seen, I've seen people who I don't consider brilliant at all, who have made millions and millions of dollars in real estate. Yeah. It's just yeah. timing and luck and, and a little timing. bit of common sense. It is timing. Um, it's also, I feel the ones that are still successful and went through that time period and they're still kind of heading strong. Um, believe it or not, I think you can relate to this. They don't have an ego about it. When you have an ego about it, like they're above the market, that's when I I found people got more in trouble. And I had that. I did. I was like, okay, I, it's not going to happen to me. And then I didn't understand. I, I didn't understand that, you know, a house I had, I bought it 170. It was worth 250. And then all of a sudden it's worth 320. And the next month it's worth like 150. I'm like, that was hard to conceptualize. Like, that can't happen. That's impossible, right. you know, and it did. And, um, you know, it's. Anyway, it's just an interesting, I come to Texas and there was a lot of people who they're what I call were uh, incubator by that. They didn't experience that. So I told them I went through bankruptcy and, and foreclosure and stuff like that. They're like, oh my God, everyone did. All my friends did. Right. Yeah. It was like, hey, how many houses did you throw back to the bank? 10, 12, 5. Oh, okay. Hmm, have a good day. It just, it was part of the time. I'm not saying it was a great time, but I'm saying it was just part of the market. And it's not because we're all stupid. It was just because of what was happening. You know, we're all not dumb people. 
I probably have 10 or 15 close builder friends. And I'd say that two thirds of them had went under. I feel really bad. And they're good people. It, it was out of their good control people. and they wanted to keep people working in jobs and they, they should have pulled back. I got lucky. I was pulled back because I was activated for the military again. Yeah. But, uh, that's how it goes. And we, we started, we started slowing down in 2004 and we missed some very good years too, but it's timing is everything. Time is so, everything. So number three, your last one in my favorite, everything happens for the best. Yes. Oh, that's, that was a gift from Joe Sugarman. I'm, I'm being really clear on who's given me these, you know, antidotes or life lessons because um, I just think I need to you know, pay it forward and also acknowledge the people before me. Um, so Joe Sugarman is the one that gave that to me and he said it such a way. And we've talked about it so many times. It's like everything happens for the best, not a reason, because if something happens to you, that's just horrific. You know, it could be something with your child. It could be yourself. It could be a car accident. When we think of our brain, everything happens for the reason we look for the reason and it, it, it can destroy you. And if you look at it, everything happens for the best of like, there's something else I need to get through this. And there's something else on the other side of this, whatever it is, it'll move you past it. And I, that gave me hope in the bankruptcy uh, because I believe me, I mean, I'm now talk about it with total freedom, but I promise you uh, three or four years ago, you couldn't get me to talk about it because it was too painful for me to even talk about. Uh, now it's just like, this is what happened. It's a part of my scars. I got some blood. I got some scar tissue here. It's no big deal. It's part of who I am. I've learned a lot. Uh, it, it gave me like, now I can give back and I can help people. And it did happen for a reason. It really, I mean, it did happen for the best. It happened so that then I can then help other people through it. So, uh, but believe me at the time when it was happening, you couldn't get me to talk about it to save your life. It was not happening to me, you know? So nowadays it's like, Hey, this is, uh, this is what I went through. This is my experience. This is what I learned. This is, a th this is why I think it happened for the best. Honestly, in, and I'll be honest, I think someone who's gone through bankruptcy and in that kind of time, um, I hear now some negative, currently uh, negativity towards Donald Trump and the bankruptcy stuff. I mean, believe, you know, whatever your view on Donald Trump is, there's some negativity about it. Like, oh, well, he's used this system and all this negativity. And I remember... I read a book actually during that time that was actually called Bankruptcy. And it was about the four, founder, four founders of our country and that the reason why they created this rule called bankruptcy, and it was a gift of entrepreneurship. We, they wanted our country to be capitalism. They wanted us to create something and fail and create something and fail. And I lived in Orlando. It's Disney. They constantly create and fail and create and win and create and fail. And it was kind of this, when I read that, I went, oh, I'm blessed to be in a country that I can fail. And then I get to start again and no one's going to put me in prison. Um, and it was kind of a gift. I think it's a gift that actually how our society is set up. We're set up for entrepreneurs. We're set up for capitalists, people to create things and to win or fail. That's what we're designed to do here in America. That's why I believe. Well, that will go to a capitalistic commercial. Okay. Well, Heather, that means it's your commercial. Hi, my name is Heather Havenwood and I am Chief Sexy Boss. And what I do is I help business owners currently use their knowledge and information, turn that into information marketing and be able to turn that into revenue for their business. So if you're interested in doing that, then great. If you're a female entrepreneur and just want to know my story and how maybe it can serve you, then you can go to sexybossinc.com. Again, that's sexybossinc.com. Or if you want to work with me, go to heatherhavenwood.com and click on the work with me. Thank you so much for listening. Excellent, Heather. And we'll have all those notes, details, and links at timelinesofsuccess.com. That's timelinesofsuccess.com. By the way, that's one of my original websites that I first built. It's transitioned. And I never name anything that long or that just timeline, something simple, timeline netcast. I should probably redirect it. Well, Heather, as we finish up the show, a lot of great information. Love to have you back to explain more yes. and talk on a Friday just about your business, because specifically about your business, how you run your business and what you do. But uh, it, you're amazing as you uh, we found you sort of I've come back from hard times, transitioned into a different industry. I do have um, uh, one last question I'm going to ask you as we sure. finish up. What made you go 
into this line of business, into the digital marketing, and, and you did the relationship business, you tied it in. What what brought all that together? Okay, so it kind of goes back to when I first started in the information marketing business, 2001. That's what um, I, I started infomercial one day and I started working for the company that was doing the infomercial. That's how I got into what I call the direct response business. And then around 2004 or five, everything's starting to go online a little bit more and more and more. And I, of course, jumped in, started going to big seminar um, with Armin Warren and learning online marketing, email marketing, list building, JV marketing, webinars, all this stuff. And then I built a business in 2004 and five with a, a, um, a business partner. And it went really great, zero to a million dollars in one year. But then, um, you know, then one day I came home and it was all gone. <laughs> he took the company, he took the merchant accounts, and that's what kind of spiraled me into the bankruptcy. So when I came back out of that, I knew that I wanted to use all the skill sets I knew of direct response marketing. And yet I wanted to do something that I could live anywhere I wanted to. And then I also wanted something that I knew that if I went into that business that information that it was going to be evergreen and no one could ever question me on that. So I didn't want to go out and start teaching people about internet marketing when it was 2007 and I was broke. Cause I just think that's kind of out of integrity <laughs> to say I can teach you internet marketing and yet I'm broke. Um, so um, I went into teaching men how to date women because why I'm a woman. I can speak from that all day long and I know I that can help people and I know that no one could question me. And it gave me the opportunity to use all the skill sets that I have a direct response and internet marketing and tie those together. Okay. Hey, when you come back on a Friday, I'm going to ask you some specific questions about that industry. Cause I'm sort of curious, not, we're not going to answer this today. That, that whole industry has changed because we have this online uh, networking system with uh, hooking people up. It's got, a, it's so different. It's so different than when I was young. Yes. Yeah, that's that's actually really true. That'll be for the next, uh, when you come back on a Friday, we're going to have to ask you that question and find out. Well, thank you. And we'll put some music on here as we finish up and talk for a couple seconds. See, I should start it nice and soft like this and then move it back up. Like what do you think? So remember to go to timelines at timelinesofsuccess.com and uh, get all your notes for Heather. So it'll be episode 149. That means that Jonathan must be coming up on Blab. Yeah. Hey, I want to introduce Jonathan to Heather. This is Jonathan. This is like the total SaaS guru developer of stuff that you and I will never do in uh, the world of WordPress and plugins and uh, software as a service. Uh, he'll just, yeah. if he tries yeah. to sell you something, you have to Ever. be a techie to understand it. Ever. So he's got an important question, though, he wants to ask. Uh, I also got words of wisdom, Heather. Okay. Listen, Heather. Whatever you decide to do, don't don't try and make a SaaS product. It will destroy <laughs> <laughs> you. Do any other kind of business, but don't make a SaaS product. It, Software it, as a service is all WordPress based. It turned you old before your time, Heather, and okay. you don't deserve that. Uh, uh, so forget. Jonathan's that. got a question after yeah. the show. Um, so the important question, Heather, being that you're the dating queen. Um, uh, so in your professional experience, um, what are some of the kind of like two or three major mistakes guys do when they're initially dating? So I call it they, um, I call it not to, how not to date or marry a psycho. <laughs> exactly. This is what happens when I tell it to an older man, meaning anyone over 40 who's gotten you know, killed by a woman. Women can make or break a man and they can either break you literally, or they can make you amazing because that's what we're designed to do. And so what you want to do as a man is your job is to figure out, sift and sort through women and figure out if they're crazy because we're all crazy or if they're psycho. So crazy is okay. Psycho is not. You got to cut that one out. So when, when men always say all the time, you know, uh, women are crazy. I'm like, yeah, they are. We are, we're, we just have this like up and down, up and down. We do, we're crazy. But 
psycho is the kind of person that will take all your crap, throw it in the front lawn, and then burn it. Okay, you don't want that. So you don't want psycho. You just want a little kind of crazy because she's kind of crazy in bed. She's got, you know, good future. She's um, active and she's ambitious. That's what you want. You want a little crazy. You don't want psycho. That's number one. Number two is men who try to date younger women, which is totally fine. My my site's called JustDateYoungerWomen.com, one of them. It's not about dating younger just by age. It's also feeling what I call younger on a personal level, feeling younger. I know women who are 40 and they act like they're 60. I know women who are 20 and they act like they're 40. So you have to be able to understand the, the what I call the importance of age, meaning age of mental age. And then I also, also tell men that, especially men in their 40s, who what I have some substance, I mean, they have a house, they have some assets, they may, you know, they have, they have like a car and they have a nice house and stuff like that. And they try to date the 21 year old. And then they get mad when there's like this drama. I'm like, look, women who are in their twenties have a lot of drama in their life. And if you want drama, then great. But if you don't want drama, then you can't date a 21 year old and expect that they're not going to have a lot of drama in their life. So that's really the number one and number two thing that men uh, mistakenly do because they look at boobs, you know, like, Oh, you got big boobs and a nice, butt. we're good. And then like, they go, Oh my God, she's psycho. And I said, well, did you not see all the red flags along the way? So that's what I help them do is make sure that they're, they don't date or marry a psycho. I didn't say they can't bang a psycho. They just can't marry. <laughs> 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 This is good on no iTunes. This is not going to be on iTunes. So we're okay. YouTube. Word. Like, is that a bad word? Bang. I don't think so. Okay. That's not explicit. Like this? It's just the way you said it there. Um, yeah. Hey, um, Jonathan. I, no, 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 this, continue with this because this is. Uh, this Jonathan's is, excited. I, this, this is the um, side Jonathan. Um, I I, I've been a bit of a slut lately, uh, Heather. I've been dating. I've been work with this guy. He's a I've been dating these Match.com ladies. Oh, and, I was going to ask about that. That's a lead. And um, to say that they're an interesting crowd would be a, a slight understatement. Um, yeah. Basically. Um, Especially in Reno and Tahoe. Yeah. To Carson say City. He lives in Carson City. To, to say that again. Um, they. What I found is, though, but I suppose you're going to say this is just normal life, is there's, the ones that seem to fancy me, I don't fancy them. And the ones that I fancy don't seem to want to date me more than a couple of times. So um, is it correct that a woman really makes her mind up about a guy's suitability in less than five seconds? I would say five seconds. I would say that men, women make the distinction. So here's what happened. they meet. They meet a they meet a guy, and they're like, "It's open. It's open." Meaning, it's open if they're gonna like, let's say, have intercourse with them. I can say that. I like this. So it's banging. So they're <laughs> like they're open, and then like something in what you say or do will like have them what I call like a point. Okay. That's a point against him. That's a point for, that's a point against him against, against, against four, four, four. And then around a period of, I don't know, depending if it's a date, you know, a couple hours, they'll make the decision, right? Okay. He is in the friend zone. And once you like get stuck in the friend zone, it is like impossible to get out. Okay. It's like, you know, it's like, it's like Hillary Clinton actually trying to be a guy. It's just impossible. Yeah. Um, can I ask you, how would you deal with when you're like that first informal date and they're in interrogation mode where um, you don't want to put them down, like to say, look, dear, I just want, I just want a coffee, have a little chat, but I don't need 20 questions about, you know, like you're the homeland security. How do you put them down softly without it coming across as a bit aggressive? Um, here, always, always, always there no chance. You, you've got to go on to the just, next. Yeah, you just have to say this isn't working. I mean, you have to be adult about it. I mean, if you're on Match.com, you know that this is an adult conversation. So it's like this is not working for me. It's not a fit. It's not a match. You just move on. I think if they get really crazy or psycho, then you're they're in the psycho, and then you just kind of run like hell. But I mean, 
That's how I'd say it. If they get, you know, but it's an adult conversation, especially when you're dealing with dating online, you have to be able to have someone who has an adult conversation about it. Like this isn't working for me. It's not a fit for me. Yeah, but why do they, um, I've met, not all, but a if, few that. Hey, that folks, have Bill, to I got, I'm going to run. I've got to go yeah. to another meeting. I'm going to let you guys on, finish up, and uh, stay on as long as you want. Jonathan is one of my co-hosts. He does an excellent job. Okay. I have to run in a few minutes too, by the way. They've got a set, set of questions and they want the right answers. And you are you do sense that you're being interrogated. Um, what, what's that about, actually? Well, women, I mean, I think this is anybody, but especially women, we, especially when we're in the dating space, we're in match.com, we're in that kind of mode. We're what I call sifting and sorting, sifting and sorting, sifting and sorting. And so when they, they, they feel that their time is limited. So if they're on a coffee date, let's just say, they're going to probably ask you what I call initial questions in their head that if you can't pass these, they just want to like kick you out. You know, and honestly, that's what they think. It's like a sifting and sorting sales process. You know, like if you, it, I'm going to ask this, if they answer this way, okay, they're out. I'm going to ask this, if they answer that way, okay, maybe they're in. I mean, they just want to know right away, do I, am I going to have a second date with this person or are they just like clicked off the list? And so I wouldn't look at it as interrogation. They're just trying to see if it's a match and it's based on women, based it on conversation, men base it on she's hot, she's got big boobies and nice ass no, I'm no, in. I, I slightly disagree with you well there. that's the initial though for men that's the know, initial and then yeah. af and then after the attraction of the female then they want to get to know them more that's just on a subconscious man level no. No. But, right it is it is you, uh, and then women want to feel safe women want to feel safe women always always date the guy they feel the most safe with and attracted to but they feel the most safe with always well, they, well, you've opened, there's two questions to that, Heather. Yeah. The, um, there's the, you know, why then, um, the safe in, why is there a sizable minority? And um, I know it's a kind of society cliche, but the bad boy effect. Yes. Um, I have seen, I have known a couple um, ex-girlfriends or just ladies that are kind of friends because they dating friends of mine and then they move on and it's obviously um they're dating somebody who's got a certain reputation and that seems to attract them to them um so i'll call it the bad boy effect so that goes a little bit against what but the other thing is um about this obviously um and i think it works for both sexes um if somebody walks in and they they totally look different to their picture or pictures or yeah. they'd be um they can be as nice as what they like but um as a somebody i'm gonna date it ain't gonna happen um but on the other hand as long as they match up i'm not gonna date somebody go out a second date if they're boring me to death or they're totally incompatible mm -hmm. to um somebody I, I can have a laugh and a chat with I just wouldn't I probably would do it in my younger days but now I just wouldn't I just couldn't see myself dating somebody a second or third time even though they I was attracted to them but they bored me to tears right Right. That's why the interrogation, I think women do that, that questioning up front because they want to sit and sort you right away to see if then they want to what I call let themselves let go and, and be more themselves around you. But that's their, that's their safety mechanism. I wouldn't look at it that way. As, as far as the bad boy goes, um, I think as women grow up, they start to say, okay, the bad boy is not, not the one I'm going to marry. And so when I say the, the women always date the ones that they, that they feel safe with, what I mean by is marriage. What I mean by this marriage is because uh, there comes a point in a woman's life when they go, okay, I can't marry the bad boy because he can't be, or he won't be around. But the piece that women are attracted to in the, in the bad boy is that they um, are unaccessible, you know? And so we want to have that chase. It's like a chase. Uh, but honestly, the, the woman will usually always date a, the woman date and marry date to marry. Okay. Not just have sex with this is date to marriage okay or date to significant relationship it will be the one that they feel most safe with and they feel like they can be themselves with and that have somehow you know answered the right uh way for their specific qu 
questions that they have in their head, whatever they want. And so it's, it's, it's a sift and sort and process in a female world as well as men. But for a female, especially if they're on a dating site like match.com, they have an intention. Like I want to get married. I want to have kids. I don't have a lot of time now. Let's do this or not. And so they have this kind of process of like sift and sort, sift and sort, sift and sort. And if you have the same kind of view, it helps. Like, okay, I, I don't have a lot of time either. This is what I want. This is what I want. This is what I want. Maybe you're not either. I want to ask you the same questions. Then it's a little more uh, even keel versus like, oh, you want to always questions. It's just that my position is a li- uh, hopefully a little bit more subtle. My position is we're meeting for the first day. Am I attracted to them and have we, can we continue this conversation? And then I would probably leave it to the second date where I would not have a list, but I would yeah. want, I would want to see what their long term um, objectives are and what, what get some sense about how they see the world and what they want from the world. But they're asking you those exact same questions. You just, yeah, you're but just in a more you know, abrupt a way. Which... Well, women are more abrupt that way because they feel they don't have as much time. If they if they were 21, they get like, I have all the time in the world. Does it matter? But if they're 40 or 35, they're it's an intent. That's just how that's just a female way. Oh, I'm much too old for that. <laughs> I, I, the 40s don't don't want anybody 40s. to do it. The forties are long gone, dear. <laughs> you, I mean, you know, it's like it depends on their age, you know, and their intentionality and where they're at in their life. You know, I remember my first date with my current boyfriend. I mean, he still talks about it. Is that um, we, you know, we went on a first date. We went to a really nice place to dinner. We did for our first date. We already met, and then it was like our first date. And after I ordered, and I did this on purpose. I tell people like after I ordered my steak and after I ordered my wine, then I asked him the interrogating questions that if he didn't answer the way that I wanted him to, like we were never, this is it. This is going to be the last day. And, uh, you know, at the time he was like, but I did it. You know, I'm already in, I'm already sitting down. I'm already like, I've already ordered dinner. I'm going to eat. And, uh, you know, we'll see how the answers go. But the answers of course were amazing. And we, you know, we haven't been, we've been inseparable since, but that's how my female brain works. Like, look, I don't have a lot of time. We're going to have a great dinner no matter what, but I'm going to ask you these questions. And if I don't like the answers, then no problem. We're just not a match. That's how people, that's how women think. That's how women think. So don't take it personally. It's not personal. They just kind of want to get through it. So you got to get through that minutia and then the fun begins. And then the, the relax woman shows up and then the kind of ease. You want to have them feel at ease and safe and you'll answer any question that you yeah. they, they do and so, then it'll uh, be fine. Oh, Thank you for the time. I just want to finish with one last question. Sure. And then, um, what is this about women that um, see, uh, I'm probably looking for a partner that um, sexually and spiritually match my view of the world. I, I think every human being want somebody special in their life. I know it's cliche, but I think it's everyone honestly, does. I think it's part of the human condition. And yeah. people people that deny that, I think they're in self denial themselves. But I don't need somebody to to really make me happy. I just want somebody to sh- and I definitely um don't need somebody that A thinks they're gonna change me or somebody that um wants to tell me that I should wear this shirt or um, um, we should do this. And that, and when I'd say, I don't think so, get in a bit of a pissy attitude um, and sulks for days and days and days because they're not getting what they think we should have. Um, kinds, kinds of puts me off a little bit. And then the English sarcasm starts to... Um, rear its head am i being unrealistic or are there ladies there that understand that a i'm not going to change and b if you start telling me what i should do it's not going to go down too well (laughs) um yeah that that's that's a harsh if you put that on your match.com profile i'm never going to change and you can't tell me what to do yeah you probably won't get any dates so um mainly because no, I, do that. I mean um obviously we can have a discussion and if you're in a relationship you've got to come to a common day. Uh, yeah there has to be a compromise and be an openness 
And I think women want to see if a, if, if, a, if a woman's like, hey, I want to go do this thing. And if you're like, no, that's a, um, a turnoff. Okay. It's a just it's an emotional turnoff. Not saying you have to do everything we do. It's just like if it's a no, it's a very um, it's a very daddy way to deal with things. It's not a relationship. If I said to my dad, a father, my father figure when I'm seven, I want to go do this. And he says, no, I, it's. It's he's my father. I'm like, mm, okay. Mm. And they, you know, they pant and rant. Um, we're a six year old, you know, we, we get upset. Um, but so if, if a, a, a man in our lives where we're in a relationship in a sexual relationship and I'm like, Hey, I want to do this. And you're like, no, I, now I feel like I'm dealing with my oh, father. I wouldn't put it that way, but, yeah, I, I, but would it, say, I would say it's not really my cup of tea. If you're really committed, obviously I will support you. And if you really want me to go. Well, that's not how I, you said it though. That's not how you said it. This is what I'm saying. Like you said it the way you said it, which was no. And so that's how my reaction is. Now, if it's like, Hey babe, I really don't want to do that. I'll go with you. I'll support you. That's totally different but you said it the way you said it which is the which is a very daddy manly father i'm gonna own you kind of way and that's a that's a uh, daddy issues you know so i think we want to say hey i want to try this and if you're like nah i don't try anything it's like okay well i want a partner that's open to trying things or um you know so it's how you respond it's how you respond uh, I bet I take any more of your time here because uh, I'm not paying for your time. So uh, I, I, thought, I thought you had a great interview with my co-host, Bill the Wizard, as I call him. Don't take uh, it personally. Don't take it personally. Don't get all personal on me because it really is. It's really like how you respond to women, your Heather, energy. Heather, I think you're a delightful, okay. charming lady, even though you support Trump. <laughs> so, uh, um, so, but I, I thought it was a fantastic interview, and uh, I think you can, you're an extremely charming lady. But, um, Thank you. but there's something missing if you support Trump, dear. But... <laughs> <laughs> Something's missing up here. Um, I get that. I get that. I get that. I, you know, I'm a, I'm obviously, a Texan. Obviously, there's something missing with me because obviously I'm a daddy. So oh, I'm a... <laughs> exactly. See. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a I'm a Texas gun runner, you know, pro gun, pro Second Amendment, pro capitalism, pro oil girl. I mean, so that's where I grew up. I'm different, I guess. <laughs> um, you have your influences, but yeah. you're one of very few com uh, positive comments Bill's ever made about me uh, um, is that he said he said you. Um, if logic is against your argument, you will you will adapt to your position, Jonathan. Mm -hmm. And obviously, we have all core opinions, don't we? Um, yeah. But obviously, if the facts totally are against my position, um, I will change change my position because obviously, um, but there are a lot of people around on the left and right that yeah. um, refute common common sense or factual yeah. information and they will just go on their swanny way won't they yeah uh, um i That's wouldn't true. say i was one of those but there we go are you a voter i mean are you a, a u.s citizen i um, um i don't know like i'm really yeah. asking so yeah no, i used to ask you're not from here no i i'm i'm english as english okay. as you can get but three years ago i decided also to become an american <laughs> citizen okay so I say to people, you were just born here. I chose to volunteer for the gig. Um, so, um, but I am, um, I am aware of the great positive things about this country, but also aware of its great darkness. Yeah. And I had a friend, I had a friend that lived a number of years in South Africa, in Johannesburg. And Johannesburg is one of the most violent, it's, it's overstated, but it, it is an extremely violent city. Yeah. But he said, he said he always felt more alive in Johannesburg than he ever did in London. Mm. And that's the contradiction, even though it was a more kind of dicier way of living. Yeah. You were kind of more alive. And that's how I explain it about America, is that 
it's more open, but it's more edgy as well. Yeah. Well, thanks for being here. Thanks for being a voter. Welcome to America. And thank you for this conversation. And I want to hear about an update of your dating and relationship, Jonathan. Oh, I want to got... hear well, your next date. I want to hear about it. We can get out of blab. We can talk about it. We talk about the date. And then we can share your experience. I've and I can some, guide you. I've, I've had some cry. Um, what, um, what I would say, ups, I, I really, it did upset me initially because you have a really... You are totally correct. If you go on to something like, but it is very hard to meet women that are to, that are available in my age group. Mm -hmm. um, so Match dot com is one of the. Uh, um, a couple of things I've noticed: a that um, some of the requirements in the personal profiles are so specific and so detailed yeah. that nobody. Um, I've also come to the conclusion there's an enormous, um, there's um, a sizable minority that want to email forever and text forever. And I realise now that two short emails, a, a telephone call, and then if you're not up, if you're not up for a face to face date, you just move on to the next yeah. one. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this. I want you to go on your next date. I'm going to give you my email and you're going to email me. And we're going to get back on Blab and I'm gonna be like, okay, what happened? How did it go? I want to hear the details and I'm going to coach you through it. Well, that's great. That sounds interesting. Um, the last two were really very nice ladies. Mm -hmm. but, um, it, it's very frustrating. They were actually. Well, hold um, on. I, don't, I want you to go on another date. I want you to go on. I want you to go on a first date. I hope in the next week. It's Christmas. I'm not sure if you can't, but uh, go on a first date and then let's get on, back on because I have to run right now. It's two thirty, my time. I had to run, but I, if you're open for it, I'll do it because I, yeah. I want you to. I want. You, I want to start from scratch. Not someone you're dating so far. I want to start from scratch after this coaching session. So go to the. Go on a first date. Tell me when, whenever it is. I'm sure you'll have something between now and New Year's. I mean, come on. Yeah, I'll get you an email from the wizard, and then mm -hmm. uh, we. Can, I'm up for it. Cool. That's awesome. Okay, great. We're the dating with Jonathan, coaching dating, finding him a mate, finding Jonathan a mate. Woo! That would be awesome. We're going to find Jonathan a mate via blab. Um, okay, great. Well, thank you for this. Thank you for everything. I'm going to go and press stop the recording.